I'm just going to play Devin's advocate for a moment because he's all young professional minds. I went to the Eagle for 2005 for the election and I was there also for the massacre in Alexandria. Okay, so I want to know as Americans why we should trust the Muslim Brotherhood or help or in any way the Muslim Brotherhood win. I'm a Zawari, it's number two to Ben Laden and a known follower of Brotherhood. Firstly, just I'm throwing this out for you. And secondly, when he, when the brother was supposedly responsible for the death of Sadat. So let's let's open it up and let's be, you know, honest about these things. Mm -hmm. Okay, appreciate it. Oh, yes. uh, I'm not saying I believe in freedom, freedom and democracy for uh, the elections, because of course I've seen it in the world. Yeah. Uh, to start with, Ayman Zawahri uh, is a very harsh critic of the Brotherhood. Uh, actually, he has probably called my grandfather an infidel at, at one point, my, specifically naming my grandfather, who was the general guide of the group. Uh, Ayman al Zawahri and the Brotherhood, we, we, Al Qaeda and the Brotherhood generally d uh, differ on uh, most of 90 to 90 percent of what they have. If you go beyond the headlines, even it's not it's not only a tactical difference about the use of violence. It's a difference that goes in. Uh, I, I, I wrote that in one of my articles, and I, and I sincerely believe that. Uh, I would prefer to live here in the United States than live under the, the regime of Taliban because, I, and I think this this uh, uh, Western democracies carry more of Islamic values than the the regime of Talib Ta Taliban because the objectives of Sharia, ah, as as I listed them and I said them and I forgot one, but I, I'm still trying to remember what that was. These objectives of Sharia, ah, you would find them more here than. Uh, I'm not saying that this is an uh, 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 an Islamic state by any. Not not trying to suggest that, but I'm only saying that. Uh, we, we disagree to the extent that I would not, I, I would not, and I assure you that I would not live under uh, uh, a, a, a Taliban or uh, a regime governed by 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 Qaeda or Taliban or even Saudi Arabia. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to live there. Second, Ayman Zawahri was in jail at the time. He was a brother. And he decided to depart the group. And he again, again, you have to. And he decided to depart to depart the group. Yeah, yeah, he decided to, and I mean, when, when, when someone sees that this is a moderate group that is not good enough for my radical ideas, this only departs you from him. It doesn't link you to him. It only departs you from him. Those people decided to join radical groups because they thought our moderate, or, uh, we, we thought that we were giving in because they thought we were not true Islamists, not true Muslims, because we were giving in because we disagreed on fundamental core issues that could not be resolved within one organization. Those are major issues that we disagree on. Uh, uh, the only person you could, who, who you could link Ayman al Zawahi to in the Brotherhood is Sayyid Qutb. And Sayyid Qutb, uh, and Sayyid Qutb has been uh, denounced, his, his thought has been denounced by the Brotherhood leadership at the time, he, just after he has finished his final writings, which I, uh, look, I have a lot of respect for anyone who would stand up for whatever he believes in with dignity until the last moment of his life, no matter how much I disagree with him. But I still disagree with Sayyid Qutb. Uh, we are on, probably on opposite ends. If you look at the thought of Sayyid Qutb and compare it to the thought of Hassan al-Banna in so many different ways, Sayyid Qutb's uh, notion of jahiliya, his notion of uh, 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 ignorance, uh, al-jahiliya, his unwillingness to accept notions such as nationalism, uh, his, uh, his, uh, cl he clearly separates between the, the, the organization and the society. The organization is on one side and the society is on the other side. So for, Sa for Sayyid Qutb, for, and, and, he cle and he clearly say, he clear Sayyid Qutb says that, and this is the fundamental uh, argument in the signpost or the milestones, I don't know, it's, it's translated both ways. Uh, 
that we and our, and our societies are at crossroads. If you go one step towards our society, we have lost the entire path. This, comes at com this is completely against everything Hassan al-Banna uh, stands for. This is completely against everything the Muslim Brotherhood stands for. We believe we are an integral and we are integral and living parts of our societies. We believe that working for the well-being of our societies is a religious obligation that we, we, we stand up and we stand up for. Compare that to, Sa to Sayyid Qutb who actually believes that nationalism uh, is, is a man-made uh, uh, notion that should not be respected and that our only, uh, our only nation is where, wherever Muslims are. So, so we, we, we clearly differ on that. Again, regarding Sadat, we have, we have nothing to do with the assassination of Sadat. Had, had we had have anything to do with the assassination of Sadat, this is a brutal regime that wouldn't have, have let us go. We, we would have been prosecuted for that. Al Jama'a al Islamiyyah and Al Jihad assassinated Sadat. Those are groups that come, again, uh, we disagree on fundamental issues. One of the main problems is that people t tend to see Islamic movements as one large movement, even if it has diversities within, but at the end of the day, it is one large movement. And that is not the case. That could not be the case. We disagree on fundamental issues. I mean, uh, the, the, what we disagree on with Al-Qaeda, uh, which is very clear. So many people here, I suppose, have studied that and know about it. We disagree not only in terms of tactics, but we disagree in terms of objectives, uh, in terms of worldview, and in terms of methods in terms of objectives, their understanding of uh, what an Islamic state would be is completely different than ours. Their under uh, we, our, ultimate objectives is, uh, our ultimate objective is inter international cooperation. Their ultimate objective probably has to do with conquering everyone, probably has to do with destruction, and we completely disagree on that. Uh, uh, if, we, if we look at the, the world view, we, be, we, we view with, uh, with a lot of, with, with full respect, humanity and human soul. And we, we regard that as sacred uh, for them. And we do realize that the conflict between uh, the, the w some Western countries and some Muslim countries is not a religious conflict. conflict. This is a political conflict that is based on interests, economic interests, uh, maybe political manipulation, uh, uh, whatever. But not, it is not a religious conflict. For Sayyid Qud and the followers of that line of thought, especially after it, it has been further radicalized by uh, the uh, members of Al-Qaeda Al and other radical groups, they believe it is a religious conflict. They believe it is uh, uh, Islam versus, or, or Muslims versus non-Muslims. We don't believe, we really do not believe this is the case. So that's another main area of disagreement we have with, with, with these groups. Uh, a third one uh, would be the tactics. They, they decide, they, they, they have a decision to, to use violence for their political purposes. We denounce that as a matter of principle. Just to let you know, of course, we, we were the first group, we were the first political group in the Middle East to denounce the 9-11 attacks. We were the first group in the Middle East to denounce the attacks in London, Madrid, everywhere in the West and in the Middle East. We were the first group to denounce that. And uh, I know for a fact that when, we were, when the statement uh, denouncing the 9-11 uh, uh, attacks was being written uh, at the Brotherhood by the Brotherhood le leadership, uh, after writing the first part of condemning the attacks, uh, some people uh, within the leadership su suggested that another part should be added condemning the American foreign policy in the region and saying that while this is wrong, this has been the, the, the foreign policy in, in the region has been the cause of that. The, the, con the uh, overall agreement was we should not try that. This would not be included because we, we would have 1,000 other opportunities to criticize the American foreign policies. But, but when it comes to moral issues, when it comes to our ethical stances, this is a crime that is unjustifiable, even if, what's, what, even if it was caused by another crime, but the crime does not justify another one. Let me just say very quickly also, when I was last in Egypt and met, I met with the head of the Cairo branch of the Brotherhood, one of the things he said which shocked me was he said, everything went wrong with side cook. You know, he blames basically the demise of Islamism as a positive force with that break, with that radical break. So that's something new, I think, that's emerged among the so-called moderate camps. So, yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. Thank you so much for visiting us, Mr. Hodegi. Now, it's no mystery that the Islamic Brotherhood is a banned political organization in Egypt, and it has been labeled a terrorist organization by multiple world governments. So, but you are still here today spreading the ideology of the Islamic Brotherhood, and they are a working minority in the titular Egyptian parliament. Why do you think that is? Do you think that the Islamic Brotherhood is stronger now that it is banned? Do you think that the fact that it is banned has made it appeal to the masses in Egypt? 
Uh, we are no, on, no, on, on no government uh, terrorist uh, list. Uh, we are not regarded by terrorist or as, as a terrorist or organization by any government over the world. You got that wrong. Uh, the second part is uh, whether being uh, uh, oppressed helps us, helps our popularity. Uh, in a way it does, but in a way it doesn't because uh, actually wh when we are oppressed, that puts us in a very awkward position. From the it, it is from the one hand crackdown from the regimes and from the other hand criticism and sarcasm from the radicals who point out to our failure to achieve anything through our peaceful means. So this is one of the, if, if, you, if you read uh, uh, Ayman al-Zawahri's statements on Egypt and on the Brotherhood specifically and see how he points to our failure in the 2005 elections, if you were there you, would have, you, you should have seen that. His, his, he, he, he points out to our failure in any type of uh, political activity where, where the regime cracks down, he just points out and says, see Muslims, the moderate approach isn't working. You should, also, you, you should come and join our groups and we, we are being more efficient. They are just trying to give up for, for, for the sake of nothing. Yes, hi. Um, I also, I... Louder, uh, a little bit louder. Yeah, Sorry. I, I actually taught a class here on Egyptian politics and I think I'm pretty well versed in Egypt. I've been traveling there for over 20 years. Um, I have several questions. Um, it's related to the recent manifesto of the Muslim Brotherhood after the 2005 elections, um, their manifesto that basically laid out their platform. And there were several um, criticisms about this platform, and I would like to, and also this, this platform has caused a lot of splinters within the group, like al Wasad and so forth. Firstly is um, the question regarding women's rights and perhaps the suppression of women in the public sphere as they are more active in the public sphere in Egypt than in any other Middle Eastern country. Secondly, the role of Christians and religious minorities, including Sufis and other religious groups that may not be as tolerated. And thirdly, the how to deal with um, tolerance or the respect or level of authenticity of how it is viewed by the Muslim Brotherhood of um, various chefs of Al Azhar and respected uh, from respected Islamic institutions. How would the Muslim Brotherhood, are they in the process of reforming their work? What direction has the Muslim Brotherhood gone in addressing these criticisms and also trying to refine this manifesto? Okay, uh, to start with, the Wasat party had nothing to do with the manifesto. The Wasat split was in 1995, it, and the, the draft manifesto, this is not the final, uh, it is only the first draft of the manifesto. It was released in August uh, 07. So the Al Wasat position, like in the middle position. Yeah. Al uh, Okay. Um, uh, you have pointed out to the three main criti criticisms uh, of the manifesto, which I'm I'm sure uh, so many people here would know about. But you pointed. Don't notice on that. You should oh. explain. Okay. Because not everyone. Okay, and the fourth one has to do with Sufis. I don't know what what Sufis have to do. I, I myself am more to, more towards the Sufi wing of the Islamic movement, so and I don't I don't think Sufism has anything to do with that. But uh, you raised the three three important questions. The first has to do with the women, uh, religious minorities, most importantly Copts, of course, and uh, the the authority and the level of uh, the. How, the concept of religious authority, how, 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 is it, how does it fit into the state, especially with uh, the, all, all that has been written about the manifesto. To start with, as you said, this manifesto does not fully represent what uh, the Brotherhood stands for. It has been taken for revision because of that. It has been taken for revision because it has received harsh criticism from inside the group as much as from outside the group. And this is the first draft. And actually, I think this is a very healthy sign that we are presenting something and discussing it and agreeing and disagreeing and taking it back for revision before we present a final uh, version of the manifesto. Now, regarding the, um, the, what the manifesto said, uh, and this, this has been clarified later on by the uh, general guide, the, man the manifesto the, the entire d debate was about the eligibility of women and non-Muslims to run for presidency. Uh, the, the, the manifesto's position on that, as clarified by the general guide, was that they are eligible to run, but we will not support them. But that position was not support, that position was debatable. That position we think, uh, and I personally believe that it is not one's gender or belief 
that uh, should make my political decision on whether or not to support him. But we have so many other factors that, uh, w that are even more important than that. But I mean, the, 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 hard, the most hardliner position within the Brotherhood would be they are eligible to run for, uh, for, uh, for all positions, but we, we will not support them if they do. And we do support them, which includes that we do support them if they do run, do run for other positions. Now, the third has to do with the religious authority. Uh, the, the, there has been this proposal. Um, again, it was mistr misquoted in uh, news reports and then mistranslated about the uh, uh, scholars, the uh, committee of scholars, the, the, that advisory committee of scholars that has to do that is uh, reviews whatever the parliament has to say. Uh, it is advisory. It, it was not uh, the, the manifesto draft states that it, it is advisory, but this is not what has been presented. Uh, but even so, but we had so many critique for that. And as soon as it was released, as soon as people like myself and so many members read it, this part was taken out completely. There should be no advice. No, no one. The, the parliament is the ultimate decision maker. By all means, nobody should review whatever the parliament has to say. Nobody should question whatever the, 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 art, the parliament uh, uh, dec decisions and uh, resolutions are. Uh, now, regarding Al-Azhar, uh, the problem is, as I uh, stated earlier, that Al-Azhar is being part of the state. With Al-Azhar being part of the state, this is a major problem. This leads to the manipulation of religion. We need to clearly separate between religious institutes and political institutes. And this is not, does not mean the absolute separa separation of uh, state and church. This is not, this is not what, what I'm calling for. Because we do believe that one value system should govern the entire thing. One value system should, 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 should be present in both. But that means that we need this uh, procedural separation be, so, so that Al-Azhar would be able to function properly away from political pressures, away from the uh, government pressures, and the state would be able to, to uh, uh, function properly without uh, using uh, uh, religious debates against each other. The political institute should do its work and the religious institute should do its, its work. Both together serve towards uh, uh, developing the, the country. That is uh, what we call procedural secularism or a civil state. We have no problem with that at all. Uh, so that's, I mean, I hope that answers the question. Can I ask you for a little clarification? Because it seems a lot of what is the difference in the splits in the brotherhood is a combination of generational and also maybe class. You know, in other words, you know, you represent both younger generation, but also very well educated. You know, there's a lot of people in the brotherhood who both come from poor, less educated, more working class. And then there's also the older generation. Is there, do you think there's kind of a kind of class generational cleavage is happening or, or do you think it's cutting across that? It's still, you can find these positions among older brotherhood members poor and that, it's, that the split is much more complicated. It is, it is of course much more complicated. Uh, yesterday I was at uh, George Washington University and we were discussing that, the anatomy of the brotherhood. And it is much, much more complicated than that. I mean, age is a factor. Uh, education is another factor. Uh, origin is a third factor. Uh, 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 age, origin, class, uh, uh, education. So we have so many different different factors that, uh, and where, where you are inside the group is another factor that would probably again influence your priorities and, and so forth. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's pretty much complicated, yes. Um, I just saw um, or noticed a little bit of a disconnect because in the beginning you said that you one of the objectives was to revive Islamic jurisprudence, whereas you were saying that you wanted to secularize. But how can you have a secular? How can you have secular institutions if your judiciary is under Islamic law? Uh, I just yeah, yeah, like, I, I, uh, What I meant by procedural secularism. Uh, it is again the, the, the issue of terms is very important because procedural secular, secularism is what we call this uh, what we accept as a civil state with an Islamic frame of reference. This is the value system that governs. So I mean, uh, I, I, I'm, I could give you a good example on that. If you want to build a church or a mosque, you would probably use the most efficient and the most competent workers, and not the most pious and righteous ones. Uh, so. You, but at the end of the day, you're building a mosque or, or a church. So, so that's 
you, the value system is one. The, you have one value system, you have the objectives are one, but everybody has his own specialization. So there's p politicians who are working in political institutes for that end. There are uh, uh, economists who are working at, in the economic field. There are, and, and, and it goes like that. Um, let me give you another example, which is uh, the, uh, away from politics that might help uh, clarify things. It, uh, uh, sports, let's, let's discuss sports, for, for, for instance. What are the values governing, the pra the, the governing sports? Are they human values that fit, fit into other parts of the society? I mean, uh, are we playing sports? The ultimate goal is to uh, increase the level of uh, coordination we have, our ability to work in teams, uh, our ability, it's just releasing our effort, uh, our uh, energy and stress in a civil manner. So is that what we're playing sports for? Or is the ultimate goal for sports victory? So then you would find lots of things that are going wrong because the ultimate, ultimate objective is victory. So it, it, it all rotates around that. So when I mean the institutional separation, everybody uh, has what plays his role, in a, but the, the, the general philosophy is the same. The general philosophy and value system that governs all is the same. And that's what we call the civil nature of the state, a, a civil state with an Islamic point or, or an Islamic frame of reference. I didn't need to use the board at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, I'm trying to get students first, just so you know. So. Uh, because we have limited time and I want to make sure students get, um, but I'll hopefully get there. Yeah, I had a political question, not a religious question. You're making the case very well that Mubarak is kind of trouble, but let's say you succeed and we lose Mubarak. Uh, he's been a U.S. ally for over 20 years. Uh, over 28 years, over 27 years actually, which is longer than my lifetime. Hmm. And whether you agree with this or not, the policy of this country, he's been a good source of stability. Now, what happens if he's gone? It's kind of a volatile region right at the moment. So if we're deprived of one of our key allies in a very sensitive part of the world, what next? Um, I don't want to say democracy should be the price of that, but are there competing objectives that are going on? Uh, uh, actually, uh, I, do, I, I, I could not agree that Mubarak was a source of stability because um, it could be short-term st stability, and that's what's happening, but that comes at the cost of long-term stability, which is in the best interest of, of everyone. Uh, you are st what, what, what co American administrations have been doing, as Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice said in Cairo in 2005, is that they, they have been doing a mistake by supporting the dictators of the region. Uh, clearly nothing has been changed about this mistake, but the, what I'm trying to say is, uh, look at the economic conditions of Egypt. Mubarak has to resort to the army now to solve economic problems, to solve political problems, very high levels of corruption never seen before, before in Egypt. You have a huge issue about, blood cont about contaminated blood, and then everybody gets away with it, and nobody is found guilty. You have a huge issue about a ferry where more than 1,300 Egyptians sink in the, in the Red Sea and no response comes. And then everybody gets away with it. No one is found guilty. You have the uh, uh, Shura Council being burnt midday, Cairo, middle of the week, no vacations. The state couldn't do anything about it. You have t tens of people di dying on daily basis because of corruption. Uh, so this is not, and the, the military has to step in to resolve uh, problems every, every now and then. This is not stability. This is short-term stability. And it is, it is getting uh, out of hands for Mubarak and for anyone else. The real, real stability only comes with democracy. There is no stability without democracy. Mubarak uh, has been, to, to, for, this, for the sake of this stability, for the sake of being him, in, in, in position, he has been promoting anti-Americanism for over 27 years. The very same 27 years that he has been in office, he has been promoting anti-Americanism. Any political ally, any political opponent, any political activist in Egypt who just has talks with the American administration or with any, with any major American think tanks or uh, uh, policy makers here is being portrayed by Mubarak's regime as a traitor. Uh, they, uh, and Mubarak then portrays himself as a defendant of national interests against American intervention. This, uh, and, and again, this takes place for all the time. I mean, I have a recent example. A couple of, almost two months ago, uh, 
Saad, Saad, Professor Saad Din Ibrahim of the American University in Cairo, I'm not sure whether you know him or not, was sentenced to two years in prison. Uh, Dr. Saad Din Ibrahim was the one who called for the conditionality of the US aid, and one, 100 million do, uh, US dollars have been put on hold because of that. Uh, so this is, he's sentenced to two years in prison because of that. At the same time, Ayman Noor, who is also in prison, writes an open letter for Barack Obama presenting his case as an Egyptian opponent, an ex-parliamentarian who is now in prison. So you have Al-Ahram newspaper, which is the largest newspaper in the country, as I said earlier, uh, having two, f and when Dr. Saad Din Ibrahim gets this sentence, we as Ikhwan Web team write a statement on Ikhwan Web supporting Dr. Saad Din Ibrahim, supporting the right of, uh, his right for freedom of speech, although we come probably at opposite ends of the political spectrum, but, but we thought that that's the right thing to do, so we did that. So we find two, pa two pages in the Ahram newspaper with a notorious uh, state security apparatus journalist writing uh, uh, that uh, Ayman Noor, and he's being called the American candidate in the last Egyptian presidential elections, uh, who, is a tra who is a traitor, who Americans have been using to manipulate Egypt's national interests, and so forth, and you get a, all, an entire page of that. And then on the, on the opposite side of the page, you have the Muslim Brotherhood and Saad al-Din Ibrahim, who could never agree on one thing, who could uh, and that's what the, the guy there writes, who could never agree on a political issue, come to agreement on destroying Egypt's national interests. And that Dr. Saad al-Din Ibrahim, uh, who has co called for the conditionality of the US aid, is because of that, because of those $100 million, because of Egypt's economic problems. And this is how it, it is being portrayed to the Egyptian people. Those $100 million that have been put on hold because of Egypt's notorious human rights record is, are the cause of Egypt's economic problems. So this is your ally, and this is how he does for, for the American image in the, in the Middle East. This is how, how much he's willing to do for the American. Uh, yeah, you have the choice between a democratic alternative that would not necessarily agree with everything the American administration uh, wants, that would not necessarily uh, uh, be a follower for the United States. Actually, it would not be a follower if it is a, democratic, uh, a democratically elected government. It would be a government that is able to stand up for the interests of its own people, forge win-win alliances, win-win uh, uh, deals with, with the American administration, where we would both benefit for tr for, from trade, for example. This is one option, which would not be 100% fulfilling for, for the American agenda. But the other one, who is willing to do anything is, is actually the cause of very high levels of hatred for them, for Americans in the, in, inside Egypt. Uh, uh, a recent opinion poll uh, um, that was just published a couple of weeks ago, actually less than that, almost a week ago, a recent opinion poll, say that uh, in the past year, 60%, and that's, that's dangerous, over the past year, 60% of Egyptians have become supporters of Al-Qaeda. That's dangerous. majority of Egyptians want democracy um, just because in that region there there hasn't been a lot of democratic style governments and that can be a difficult transition to attempt to for any government to transition from one type of government to the other and how do you do you think that that would be a difficult transition to make if you were ever able to achieve a democratic government we will be able to achieve that one day. It's hard. Egyptian people, of course, want democracy, but the structural barriers against democracy are very hard. Uh, some things are very clear, like emergency law, like, uh, uh, I mean, we do have freedom of speech in Egypt, but, is, but it is illegal freedom of speech. Every law in Egypt goes against freedom of speech, goes against freedom, uh, freedom of press. But he allows that. The regime allows that to happen. But if they want to crack down on someone, they have all the legal tools to do so. So I mean, there are so many structural barriers, but those are the clear ones. The unclear ones have to do with the way the state institutes are being designed and how they have been manipulated since 1991 all the way to 2005 or 2006 so that people working for the state, for the, for the government, which the government in Egypt is large. I mean, it's... Uh, 4.5 million, I think, I'm not sure, of what, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I have the exact number, but it's around 4.5 4, 4 million employees. So 4.5 million plus 1.5 other in the uh, security and army and so forth. You have all those people feeling insecure, feeling the necessity to 
for t to, to, to be 100% loyal to the regime to maintain their jobs. Everybody needs a signature for from, from, from the president to get a renewal for his job uh, in the government. And this might be fine. This might be fine if you have real de institutional democracies where you have the, the president himself being accountable. So he will have to choose the right people to, 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 function, to function properly. But in Egypt, the, the, the one person with the most uh, re, re, with the largest number of authorities and responsibilities is not questionable, is, is not, uh, nobody could, could question what he's doing. Actually, he could just dissolve the parliament like that, while the parliament could not, could, could not do anything about it. So there are so many structural barriers to democracy that we need to work on. There is a very weak civil society in Egypt. This is one, one, one other thing we're trying to fix, so that we have a gigantic state apparatus versus individuals. And this uh, any individual would feel very weak to stand up against such a huge, huge state apparatus. Uh, <clears throat> question, you said 60% of Egyptians are supporting Al Qaeda now. Um, I was reading a little bit about kind of the discussion between Dr. Farrell and, you know, Aydem um, Sahibi about the, from the Al Jihad movement, kind of the, the change or is kind of, you know, he's switching positions to be. Um, revising some of the original writing that has supported Al-Qaeda. How much is the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood involved in that? Is it uh, kind of supporting kind of this internal religious debate about the rightfulness of Al-Qaeda and its action in kind of counterbalancing this kind of support? Or is it more like the uh, nonviolent move political action? Or is this the religious debate? We have been uh, engaging in that uh, specifically in the 1990s when that was a major issue in Egypt, the issue of violence. I mean, the 1990s were, it was a horrible decade in Egypt. Tens of people, hundreds actually of uh, Egyptians and foreigners alike losing their lives in terrorist attacks in Egypt. Uh, at that time, uh, we were working towards reforming the ideas or actually going into discussions with the, with the leaders of these groups. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether, whether this is the same, whether we, we still have room to do the same right now because uh, it wouldn't be politically correct to sit with those people, I think. It, it would cost us more than, it, it would significantly ha have a, hi a, high, a high price, I think. Although I'm sure it is being done in an unofficial manner sometimes, but uh, I'm not sure. What, um, I'm, I'm again, again, those who are, who are now leaders of, the, of this ideology are not inside Egypt as they were back in the 1990s. They are mostly in Afghanistan, so it's, it's not that easy, again, to, to, to discuss things as we used to, 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 go, to go into debates and dialogues as we used to. But uh, most of those elements uh, who are now uh, renouncing violence have been de-radicalized de during their imprisonment with Brotherhood members in the 1990s. And actually, uh, prison in Egypt has been bringing about everyone together. I mean, Egyptians meet in prison now. Egyptian polit political opponents meet in prison. Prison uh, has brought Saad al-Din Ibrahim and Khairat al-Shatir of the Muslim Brotherhood closer together. Prison has brought, uh, has made the moderate uh, uh, wing, the, the um, moderate, most moderate uh, elements of the Brotherhood work uh, on moderating and de-radicalizing the radical elements of radical groups in the 1990s. So prison is, is a good is, is a good place for discussions in Egypt. Yeah, let me just say we have about 15 minutes left, so um, you need to be a little bit shorter. Maybe okay. we can get all, all, all the questions and some ones. Yeah. Um, to what extent do you think this increase in Al Qaeda support correlates to our administration and the instability in it and the way that we're portraying democracy really poorly? Uh, the Bush administration, of course, has a huge impact on that. Uh, what he says and what he does has a huge impact on that, a significant impact on that. Again, this 60% thing, I'm not uh, sure it is really representative. I mean, it may be support for some of what they do, but I mean, co real support for Al-Qaeda, I don't think, uh, uh, it's just that it's, it's, I read that in the newspapers a couple of days ago, uh, almost a week ago, and I thought it was uh, really striking. Uh, but it's of course related, I mean, we, we used to say in Egypt that uh, we as moderates, and I'm sure that moderates here as well, feel that we're in a very awkward position because we are between two ends, uh, two people, each of them uh, thinking that he receives revelations 
and each of them thinks that he wants to fix the world and that uh, the world should go his own way. And those are Bush and Bin Laden. So that we are all stuck in, 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 the, in between. So we hope, we hope that things would soften up a bit. Uh, we, we hope that we would have that the next administration, whichever administration would come, would be a bit different than that. I was wondering, you were saying that stability, um, stability cannot be achieved without democracy. And then you were also saying previously that you would encourage women and people, sorry, people who are not Muslim to run for politics or to be engaged in politics, but you wouldn't support them. I, I didn't say he would use the I mean, sorry, the Russian, yeah, the, the manifesto. Um, I was just wondering how, how you would justify achieving democracy when you aren't able to utilize 50% of your population. So how do you f fully, fully, how are you fully able to you know, achieve democracy if you're not extending that freedom and restricting it for certain population, certain areas of your population? Actually, and, no, just, okay. and I was just wondering second, is um, what the Brotherhood's opinion of sexual harassment in Egypt was and whether they would work towards fixing the problem or whether they considered it a problem at all, which I think it alarmingly is. Uh, regarding the first part, um, we, we are not trying to let aside the 50% of the population. I mean, we would not have 50% of our population as presidents. It's, it's only a restriction on one position. And again, I think this is, be, this is being revised. And it's not restrict, restriction on the elig eligibility to run for the position. It's on our support as a group for that. And again, it is being revised. So I mean, uh, that's, that has been overcapitalized on. It should, it's, it's not that, that core issue. And to, I mean, let anyone run for, for the president. If the brotherhoods don't support him and he wins, he, he becomes president at the end of the day, or she becomes president at the end of the day. That's not, that's not the real issue. Uh, regarding the issue of sexual harassment, it is, of course, uh, an important issue. I mean, uh, our parliamentarians have discussed that. Uh, we have discussed that. I have written an article on that and have been inter interviewed in several, or a couple of articles on that. This is actually extremely dangerous for the, for an, for the Egyptian society uh, and not speaking about the way the government has been tackling that is, is ridiculous. I mean, it speaks about how that would harm tourism. Actually, it's, it's not about tourism. It's not about tourism. It's about our values as a, as a society. And what's going on is really disastrous and needs a lot of reform. Reform that starts from the educational system. Reform that starts from resolving our economic crisis. Uh, oh, it's, it, it needs to be discussed from, uh, if, if we, I mean, Mark asked me to be <laughs> as short as possible, so ju I'm just stating the headlines, but we could later on discuss the details of it. Is the Muslim brother a position that it, it should be a legal obligation, or, or is this a, in other words, is it, our position is that the Sharia or the Quran states that women should wear a hijab, but if they don't want to, that's between them and God. This is a front page magazine article, because they got that quote, that, ex that exact quote from one of my articles, and forgot that the next line, the very next line states, but it is up to a Muslim woman to decide whether or not to abide by it. So then there's uh, a difference between a religious obligation and a law. A not legal. everything, not everything is implemented by the state. The state has a rule, the individual has a rule, the society has a rule, so you couldn't just say that everything, that the state should be doing everything on behalf of the individual, on behalf of the society. That's, that, that's never the case, that never works. Never works that way. Uh, sir, I have to ask your indulgence because I did come late and I, I missed a lot of your remarks and I may have missed something that was pertinent to my question. Uh, I, I wanted your comment on a uh, document that I have, and I have copies in Arabic and English that I'd be happy to give to you and pass up front so that you could read them yourself. Uh, this came out of the trial of the Homeland Foundation. It's a government exhibit, and what it is is a memo, uh, which I would like to point out is dated 1991 from Mohammed Agra, I believe it is, his name is on here, to affiliated organizations in the United States with the Muslim Brotherhood. And I'd just like to read one really quick short paragraph, and then I'd like you to comment on it, okay? Okay, it's on page seven, and, uh, you know, if you guys could pass that up to them. There's English and Arabic. And I'm reading from the English page on page seven, <coughs> and it's uh, section four, and it's entitled, it's page seven of 18. <laughs> 
understanding the role of the Muslim brother in North America. And it says, the process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all the word means. The Ikhwan, I think that's your, your website, must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands in the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. Without this level of understanding, we are not up to this challenge and have not prepared ourselves for jihad yet. It is the Muslim's duty to perform jihad and work wherever he is and wherever he lands until the final hour comes and there is no escape from that destiny except for those who choose to slack. But what would the slackers and the mujahideen be equal? Uh, I'd just like you to comment on that. Is that the position I'm of the very, Muslim I'm brother? very uh, surprised that you know about these documents, but you don't know that it was put before court and it was found unauthentic and it was found irrelated to the Muslim Brotherhood and it was found, it was put before court and the, the court found that these are unauthentic documents and they have nothing to do with the Muslim bro Brotherhood. So I'm actually surprised that you know all about them, you know all about the details, but you don't... It's a government exhibit in a, in a federal trial, sir. No, excuse it's me? It's a government prosecution exhibit. Yeah, and, and it was found, it, uh, th those documents were found unauthentic, they are found uh, the, uh, not related by any means to the Muslim Brotherhood. This is not, actually the Muslim Brotherhood has no presence in North America to start with. The, we are, we, we do not have any presence in, North, in, in the continent of North, of North America to start with. These have been made as only just uh, uh, ways of threatening people of the Muslim Brotherhood, just as so many other people try to do. I mean, I could, I could write, uh, we face that in Egypt lo lo a lot of the time. We, we have uh, newspapers like the right-wing radical newspapers here, we have uh, uh, government newspapers in Egypt which do the same sometimes. And then everybody just forgets about that later on because it's, it, it, it's, not, it's irrelevant, has nothing to do with the Brotherhood uh, agenda, has nothing to do with the Brotherhood's ideology, and is a very clear departure from the Brotherhood's ideology. I mean, how would you relate that to everything Hassan al-Banna has written? How would you relate that to everything that has in, been in the literature of the Brotherhood? But didn't Hassan al-Banna say that uh, the, the aim, one of the aims, principal aims, was the imposition of worldwide Islam under Sharia? No, he, he didn't say that. Actually, Hassan al-Banna made a very clear distinction between the West as an occupation force and the West as a civilization. Hassan al-Banna clearly stated that at, uh, whereas we oppose the West as uh, an opposition force, we, 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 our ultimate goal is what we called, inter, inter, what he called international cooperation between the two, between the, the, uh, the uh, East and the, he called between the East and the West. And he said that we, we share brotherly feelings for everyone one, all, all, all over the world. And and we do not believe in the first place in this East versus West thing. And that this notion is only there, this notion is only there because of the aggression that is taking place. And we should limit the feelings of uh, wanting to resist that to the locations where, the, where, where, uh, occup uh, where, where there is occupation. So your answer to me is that that document is a forgery. That that's 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 a forgery. That's not related to the Brotherhood. It might be, uh, it might, so, someone might try to document. It's it's not related to the Brotherhood. Yes, by any means. Maybe you can get you can help yeah, I mean, get a statement, official statement that came out yes, at the time yes. denouncing okay. this as a forgery. Okay. I, I don't. Um, okay, we have time for two. We have time. Why don't, why don't you guys talk about it afterwards? Uh, we have time for two two questions. Two more questions. Yeah. Hi, uh, I spent part of last year studying at AUC as well, and uh, I noticed that a lot of people there, especially Copts, are very worried about the Muslim Brotherhood uh, coming to power. I'm from a Coptic family, and I've heard a lot of, you know, not so positive commentary on the Muslim Brotherhood, and I was wondering why you think Copts are scared, and that they have reason to be scared, and how would it affect change in their daily lives? I need some time for that question. Okay. Uh, I, I do realize, and uh, everybody in Egypt, every, every fair observer in Egypt would realize that there is real discrimination against religious minority, most importantly Copts in Egypt. But this religious discrimination goes back to the 1970s. The Brotherhood goes back to the 1920s. So uh, this entire thing emer emerged in the 1970s, and uh, I, I need to be seeing you when I'm talking. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it, it was in the 1970s. Um, Part of his combat against the Brotherhood, President Sadat, once the President Sadat came to power, one of his problems was that he had a strong uh, opposition group that has an Islamic uh, frame of reference. 
So he want, to combat that, he realized that he would also need another Islamic movement to combat that. So he opened gates, wide gates, for the Wahhabi movement to have strong presence in Egypt. In the 1970s, uh, the 1960s, there was very, very little Islamic literature. So people were actually starving for Islamic literature. All of a sudden, in the 1970s, you have the books of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab being distribu distributed for free in Egyptian mosques, in Egyptian uh, uh, um, amongst, and they affect the uh, Pre, uh, preachers, so it affects the Friday ceremony, so it, it comes, it affects not only the Islamic movement, but the Egyptians at large. I'm sure that if you ask an average Egyptian, unfortunately, and this is sad, I mean, if you ask an average Egyptian uh, who has nothing to do with the Islamic movements about his opinions on women and Copts, you would be disappointed. And, and, and we all know that. And I was in Egypt a couple of months ago, I, just, I was just saying that story yesterday, I was in Egypt a couple of months ago, uh, with uh, a founding member of Al Wasat Party, which is an Islamist party, uh, he was telling me a, story, a very weird story. Uh, a couple of weeks, a month earlier, or weeks earlier, there were promotions at the state security apparatus or in the police department at large, and part of that was that a Coptic uh, uh, general has been appointed as the governor for one of the go uh, Egypt's upper Egypt's governorates. So when uh, that founding member of the Wasat Party went to meet with. Uh, the, one of the officers to congratulate him for his new position. The officer told him, did you see the catastrophe that took place? So he told him, what catastrophe? He told him, that's a disaster. General so-and-so, I can't remember the name, became, the, uh, became a governor. So he told him, and what's wrong with that? So uh, the state security officer tells him, uh, come on, he's, 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 he's a Christian. So he tells him, and I have not, no problem with that as long as I mean, he's doing his job. I'm not, he, he's not leaving the prayers. He's working as a governor. So uh, the, the state security officer tells him, uh, you as Islamists used to have our respect, although we crack down on you. But if those are your positions on non-Muslims, then you don't even have our respect. So uh, this is just to tell you that it, is, it goes beyond the Islamic movement. Now there are three main uh, elements that have to do with that issue, or three main parties who share responsibility for that. Most importantly is the Islamic movement. Because, as I said uh, uh, earlier in my speech, we are the largest opposition group in Egypt. So, so we should uh, live up to our responsibility of asserting the ri minority rights of other groups. We are trying to do that, but it's not enough. In 2005 elections, we had around seven or eight uh, Coptic candidates on our lists. They were pressured by the state security apparatus, and they decided to withdraw. Uh, after the elections, <coughs> Uh, we, tried to, we, we started w working closely to, uh, and bridging the gap that, that, that was clear at that time, but it was against very severe uh, state security pressure, mass arrests from the Brotherhood members working on that, uh, uh, mass detentions, so that, that also stopped. I was personally involved in talks with people like uh, Samir Moros, uh, George Isha, um, and it, it, they were all going in a very positive uh, direction, except that there was real pressure from the regime to stop such talk. The Egyptian regime is following a very old theory of divide and rule. They are trying to keep everybody scared from the other so as to be able to control the Egyptian society. Uh, Pope Shenouda was saying in one of his private conversations, but it was taped by the state security apparatus, that he has no real problems or no fundamental problems with the Brotherhood's agenda, and that he indeed sees it as a better alternative from the one, one presented by the Egyptian regime. For that mere statement that was made in a private meeting, all Muslim Brotherhood members that had to do with any type of relations with the church have been arrested. Some of them have been transferred to military tribunals, and some of them have been, are now spending long years in prison because of that. But that doesn't mean that we're doing our part fully, because it doesn't only come from leadership. It comes from the, 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 large, gr from the group at large. So yes, I, I, we do realize that we have a deficit on that, and we, we, we are trying to reform it. The other side is uh, the, the, the Coptic side. Uh, I mean, we, we still need uh, more engagement from Copts. We still need them to, we need them to see f there so that we'd, we'd reach out for them. We need to see people like George Isha, like, like, Samir, like Samir Moros, like Amin Iskandar, like Rafi Habib. Those are the people we know because those, those are the people who appear there. Those are the people who are struggling. I mean, uh, we don't want... Copts should not be pleased by the fact that they have a, a minister in the government uh, who is, uh, um, I mean, very closely... Uh, related to, to the uh, corruption. I mean, being part of the nationalist movement is not, being, is not having a minister or two in, in, in a corrupt and notorious government. It is having presence in the Egyptian street with Egyptians. The third 
uh, uh, part which is, to, uh, which is to blame for that is the Egyptian regime, which again is clearly has an interest in that, clearly has an interest in keeping the Egyptian society divided. This goes against the, the interest of uh, us as the Muslim Brotherhood. It goes against the Egyptian of us as Egyptians at large. It is very dangerous to see the Egyptian society being torn apart because of, again, silly mistakes that have been made by the Islamic movements in, movement, in cold, including some of the statements made by the Muslim Brotherhood in the 1970s, including some of the statement ma statements made by the Muslim Brotherhood in the 1980s. We have uh, ch shifted our positions on that. We have changed our positions on that. Uh, but we still, again, uh, as I was saying about the issue of trust, building trust amongst Egyptian p opposition groups politi uh, uh, altogether, this is an important part of it. Okay, let me ask one, take liberty to ask the last question because I think it's relevant and then, and then I'll ask everyone to say thank you and, and leave as quickly as possible because we have a lot of my class to get through in the next hour and ten minutes. But, you know, whenever I'm in Morocco or other places, uh, the Islamist parties like Adel Waqsan, Justice and Charity and others always say, we're always getting blamed for what someone else is doing. In other words, people tend to confuse us because we're the main opposition group to the government with someone else, which serves the government fine. When people are scared of the brotherhood, I mean, has the brotherhood, the Ikhwan in Egypt, become the shorthand that people use without thinking for this entire larger Islamic tendency? And, or, and is that one of the things that the brotherhood needs to work on, or a younger generation to try to carve out a very specific position? Or do, or, or do people in Egypt have a pretty good understanding of the brotherhood versus you know, Islam is larger, more large. Uh, Egyptians, uh, like others, mix the terms uh, very much. I mean, all Islamists are just Islamists. So w w we get the blame for every, we get blamed for every uh, foolish act by, by an Islamic movement, including some foolish acts by member of the Brotherhood, which but b members who do things that are not endorsed by the group. But we get we get blamed for anything that goes wrong in Egypt, unfortunately, except for violence, because Egyptians realize quite well that we are very far away from violence. This, e even President Mubarak, with all the crackdown, he ha he, all his crackdowns on the Brotherhood, he has made an important statement in 1993, saying that th there are two distant uh, trends of political Islam who are different than each other. The first is, mo is uh, has a moderate orientation, a peaceful moderate orientation, engages in the public life, uh, uh, participates in elections, and, uh, and another one is a violent, hostile movement that targets uh, its opponents, kills, kills its opponents, and so forth. This is a very clear statement. I mean, uh, you have to realize the clear difference between the movement that disagreed with and the, the, the Egyptian intellectual Farak Fouda, and they discussed that in a debate in the book fair, and the movement that agreed, disagreed with Farak Fouda, so they just killed him. That's, that's a major difference between two different trends of political Islam in Egypt. Okay, well, why don't we give thank you.